I'm Shaha Razani, and in the news, anti-Semitism at USC remains unanswered. Last May, Yasmin Mashayach, a student diversity and inclusion senator at the University of Southern California, Viterbi Graduate Student Association, tweeted, I want to kill every mother mm, Zionist, along with several other anti-Semitic slurs. In June, she tweeted, death to Israel, and it's the U.S., as well as, if you're not for the complete destruction of Israel and the occupation forces, then you're anti-Palestinian. If you think she regretted any of it, she did not. Mashayek doubled down on those tweets on a podcast by Palestine in America on December 2nd, saying she feels no obligation to apologize. A few months ago, we spoke here at JBS with Ken Marcus, founder of the Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, and discussed the issue of accountability for such statements and the apparent lack of action by the administration in this regard. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by USC alumna and social media activist for Israel, Emily Schrader. Emily recently penned a marvelous op-ed on this issue in the Jerusalem Post. She is the founder and CEO of digital marketing firm Socialite Creative, an Israeli-American, and she's based in Tel Aviv. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, so let's dive straight into this issue. Uh, first of all, tell us about these tweets. When were they discovered? When did they come up? And what has been happening in this regard ever since May? Okay, so these tweets were first actually brought up, I think, in late May following the operation. Um, and USC really did nothing, which has un really unfortunately been par for the course. They've had several anti-Semitic scandals in the past few years, and they have taken insufficient action on all of them, which has led us to where we are today. Now, a few months after May, I found these tweets, and as an alumni myself, was outraged, obviously. So I brought them up on my social media along with several other pro-Israel activists, and they started getting a lot more attention. Before we dive into uh, what you did about this, I just want to ask you, because I'm sure our viewers are interested to hear, you mentioned that you are um, a USC class of 2012 uh, alumni yourself. How was it for you when you went to school there um, as far as the Israel atmosphere? And how do you think, if at all, it has changed over the years? So I think that California campuses have always struggled with anti-Semitic incidents. USC, as a private school, not part of the U.S. UC system has actually fared better over time than U UCLA, for example. However, when I was there, there were some problems with the Students for Justice in Palestine, which I would unquestionably label a hate group. Um, and they did do a lot of anti-Israel activity. There were some events with BDS. However, I actually was one of the people who wrote about them in the school paper when they violated school policies. And during my time, they were actually suspended for two years for harassment of Jewish students. Now you see a very, very different environment where the school continues to make excuses for the outwardly anti-Semitic behavior of some of these student groups and activists. And instead of taking a stand on these issues, they're saying, well, free speech, free speech, free speech isn't calling for violence. Uh, not, not to mention outright killing, you know, of people, of fellow Jews on campus. Now, I'm, I just want to uh, just, you know, dive a little deeper on this. Why do you think the administration was quicker to act when you were there, um, when the issues came up, but now we're seeing a much more hesitant and passive administration vis-a-vis -vis such blatant threats of violence and, uh, and, and murder? I think that the school administration is concerned about being perceived as taking a side. Um, ironically, that doesn't make any sense legally speaking, because if anything, in terms of the legal status of these issues, anti-Semitic attacks are viewed the same legally on university campuses as anti-Zionist attacks, according to the executive order that President Trump signed, which is still in effect under President Biden. That means that USC could actually you lose federal funding should they not treat these issues the same when there are anti-Semitic incidents against uh, Jewish students in the name of anti-Zionism. That didn't even exist when I was there. But we've seen that the environment has been normalized to accept so much anti-Semitism in the name of anti-Zionism that it's an entirely different ballgame now. And unfortunately, it's not just USC that's dealing with this. USC is one of the worst because the scandal has come up, but it's not alone. There's a lot of university campuses who are dealing with similar issues and Jewish students are under attack. 
you um, you came on a couple of times before. You have a, an, a tremendous, really impressive and magnificent, you know, social media outreach. The ability to convey messages on behalf of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people um, with many such great causes. I want to just for, narrow it down to this case specifically. What did you do? Just so that when people learn how to react when they encounter such instances themselves, what did you do when you discovered those tweets? What were the kind of reactions you received? Um, and how did that impact the conversation in this regard? Well, first of all, I screenshotted everything <laughs> because as soon as you see anti-Semitic content and people start being held accountable for it, no matter where they're from, students or, or anyone else, uh, those things tend to disappear. Um, it's funny, people don't like being held accountable for their hate speech. Um, however, this case was interesting because she actually didn't. She actually doubled down, which gave me and other activists plenty of content to to speak to USC about these issues. So obviously, I screenshotted the content. I shared it across my social media platform. And I also reached out to other activists I know and other alumni that I know who care about these issues, including donors, including people from the Jewish community, including Jewish organizations on campus, including current student leaders, many of whom are Jewish themselves, who feel under threat, who felt under attack. And in response to a lot of these uh, posts that I made, I got comments from people who wanted to apply to USC, who ended up changing their mind because of the post that I sent, not just because of what I showed, but because USC's lack of response, because they failed to do anything substantial against the anti-Semitism on their campus. And it isn't the first time such an incident has happened. Um, and I also got messages from many, many, many alumni people that I studied with, both Jewish and non-Jewish, who, who were outraged by the type of content that we were seeing. Um, I also had a lot of uh, international press reach out um, and want to speak about the trend on campus of anti-Semitism and the unfortunate attacks on Jewish students that we've seen. So all in all, I think that it was good to draw attention to this issue, because as I said, it isn't just happening on University of Southern California's campus, it's happening all over. But the response from USC, as someone who is an alumna, is very, very disappointing. Very. Have, they, have they responded to you in any way, shape, or form? USC did. I, I reached out to several of the deans, both of the Viterbi Engineering School and of the university itself. Um, and both of them said, first, they tried to qualify it by saying, well, the student you know diversity equity and inclusion senator it's not something that the school has any responsibility for it's an elected group it doesn't matter even if she is positioning herself on an official usc website as a student leader something needs to be done about it and something needs to be done about it publicly and then they said that her you know well we we don't nothing, agree nothing with this speech been done. nothing has been done about this publicly everything publicly no nothing publicly Some no threatening the murder of Zionists of Jews on campus and nothing has been done publicly. Yeah. Incredible. And yeah. you can just imagine the kind of reactions that uh, uh, would ensue if somebody would come out and say, you know, something about the uh, BLM movement or any other movement, or the kind of response we may see from administration in this regard. But when it comes to Jews, it's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, in their statements, both from the dean in statements that they posted on their own website and on social media, they stated that, you know, we don't agree with it, but it's free speech. This is highly debatable. And I spoke to many, many different lawyers. You know, you mentioned Ken Marcus earlier. I spoke with Elise Levin from from the same center. She also said when it comes to this, it's for me, it's not just about human rights, it's also, uh, and about free speech, it's also about the fact that they have a double standard, that they are holding these students, Jewish students, and the discrimination against Jewish students to a completely different standard than they would any other group. And I spoke to Alan Dershowitz about the legality of the issue explicitly, and he said unequivocally that calling for the murder of a protected group is not free speech. Um, he said a lot of the other comments, they're very hateful. It's a it's a very gray area when it comes to issues of free speech. And, you know, the standards for free speech are actually higher on university campuses. So the university is well within their rights to suspend uh, Yasmin or to even expel her. But when it comes to even the U.S. Constitution, which is the highest standard of free speech, you should be able to say just about anything. He argued that unequivocally that this was not this was not a free speech issue. And, so and for like, USC to try to defend that and defend their lack of action against anti-Semitism on campus, it's really, really disappointing. 
so it's, it's you're talking about suspension and, and even taking actions against Yasmin, but we're talking about condemnation, clear cut condemnation, and they're hiding behind free speech. Now you mentioned Professor Dershowitz, whom you um, interviewed and mentioned in your Jerusalem uh, post op-ed quite uh, clearly about what is the protected speech and what it is what is not, and this clearly does not fall under protected speech as a direct threat of violence. Right. Right. So this is what he confirmed, um, that this that the, the issue of violence has nothing to do with free speech. Um, it should not be protected. And it's very disappointing that USC is using that as an excuse, not only at least at first, not only to uh, not take action against Yasmin, but as a university to, to excuse this instead of taking a strong stand on anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, it's the same thing we've seen. It's just another it keeps getting more extreme. You know, Rose Rich was a student government, I think, vice president a year or two ago, who was actually removed from her position by other students because she was a Zionist explicitly. That was the reason. Instead of taking action in, you know, a proper amount of time, which is immediately, the university did nothing until months later. And then only after significant pressure, they said, oh, yes, we condemn anti-Semitism. Well, that's not enough. And the reason that we see another incident like this what's happening with Yasmin is because of that, because of that cowardice, because of the inability of the USC administrators to stand up to another form of racism. And they would do it against any other group, any other group. But when it comes to Jews, they don't care. And, and you know, um, it, it goes even deeper than this, because at the end of the day, um, when they allow these things, just like you say, to keep quiet, this is the kind of reaction we're receiving. And here you come and your messages continue to apply pressure because too many a time we see these kind of statements, you know, are hidden under the radar or go away after a couple of months. And there is nobody to continue crying out against them and to continue applying pressure on the administration to act. And thanks to you and your outreach and many organizations and activists like us, we are able to continue to push this issue forward so that we don't allow the USC, you know, to get away with it. And in addition, it's this continuous response of we condemn anti-Semitism and any other form of hatred. There is this lack of desire to recognize anti-Semitism for what it is and its ancient roots and negative impact continuously, even today as we speak. Yeah, I think that the initial statements, the first couple of statements actually from USC were really, really disappointing, to put it lightly, because they sort of all lives mattered. The issue of anti-Semitism, of course, any form of discrimination is deplorable, but not all groups are being targeted and not all groups are receiving tweets from, you know, elected senators of diversity, equity, inclusion of all of all positions saying that they want to kill all of a certain group who are regularly walking around on campus. And let's not forget the fact that she was tweeting this at a time when there was a military operation going on between Israel and the Palestinians, which makes you think that it's far away from home, right? Maybe it's not a credible threat, except that we saw in Los Angeles, where Yasmin is situated, that there were attacks on Jews. Why? In the name of the exact same rhetoric that Yasmin was tweeting. I would argue that this is absolutely a credible threat. And if I was a Jewish student on campus at USC, I would not feel safe with Yasmin on campus. Absolutely not. You know, one of the um, one of the tweets you shared and screenshot in this regard um, said, "Palestinians in Haifa casually burning a man's face. I love it here." And she actually not only retweeted it, but she tweeted, "Laugh, LMFAO." They did though. I mean, can you believe it? Laughing at such displays of hatred. Yeah, I just think it's absolutely appalling in it. And, and, and this is the thing that was a little bit more disturbing about some of Yasmin's comments than the normal anti-Semitic even comment that we see on Twitter. She enjoys the suffering of another people. There's something not right going on with her. And the fact that the response after she was called out for this content was to double down. She even tweeted after the fact that she's not sorry for any of it. And this is the language of resistance. Um, which tells you a lot about what, what they're talking about when they say Palestinian resistance. I don't think that anybody should be endorsing or praising violence, and we shouldn't be excusing that regardless of what the state of Israel does. Let's say Israel's completely in the wrong, which it isn't. That still doesn't excuse the targeting of civilians anywhere, Jewish people abroad or Jewish people in Israel. And this is something that USC, at the very least, needs to make a very, very clear and strong statement on because they're entering dangerous territory. And I mean dangerous as in the potential for physical violence. 
Emily, um, a lot of people watching this, whether online or on TV, um, have connections with either USC, have students in the family, uh, donate to academic institutions. How do you propose they should move forward in applying pressure in this case and making it into an example? Because this has to be a message clearly sent across the board to other administrations across the country that anti-Semitism is unacceptable and need to be acted against rather than just fumbling and mumbling these general um, you know, euphemisms about standing against hate of all kinds. What do you think needs to be done and how can our everyday viewer be part of this struggle? So first of all, I think that anybody who is an alumni or anybody who is a donor to USC should stop supporting USC. Um, and make it very clear that that is their motivation. As an alumni myself, we get these phone calls asking for you know, alumni to support the university. Just because of this, I would never. And I know that there are many, many other people like me, both from my class and older, including major donors, who are uncomfortable supporting the university, given that this has been their response to so many anti-Semitic incidents. They need to feel the consequences for their failure to take action against anti-Semitism. That's number one. Number two, I think that it's really important that USC, if they continue to refuse to deal with anti-Semitism, that they face legal consequences. I think that if there are students who can stand up, who feel comfortable standing up to the administration, refusing to deal with this, that there is a legal case to be made, that USC has consistently failed to protect Jewish students on campus which does disqualify them from any form of federal funding. I know they're a private university, but they absolutely do receive forms of federal funding. They receive coronavirus relief, millions of dollars. And I don't think that they should qualify for that. They have proven time and time again over the last few years, not only are they not protecting Jewish students from anti-Semitism on campus, not only are they not taking a stand against anti-Semitism, but it's getting worse. They've had multiple opportunities to do so and they are not taking action. And if they are, it's far, far, far too late. We need to see concrete actions. And then in regards to USC and what they can do, number three, USC needs to come out publicly and state what they're doing with Yasmin. This isn't a private, this isn't a privacy concern as they stated. It's that they don't want to receive condemnation from the other side from pro-Palestinian activists who are known for harassing and threatening universities and companies and individuals who, who come out against this language of resistance, um, they don't want to deal with that pushback. And they need to deal with that pushback no matter what, because it's the right thing to do. And it has nothing to do with being against Palestinians or being for Israel. It has to do with doing what's right. I wouldn't say uh, that they should do any different if the language was being used against Palestinians either. I don't support any form of violence, especially on campuses. It's outrageous. Um, so USC needs to take a stand here. You know, you, you actually um, mentioned a very important point of what is pro-Palestinian, because in many ways, when I listen to you standing up for truth, standing up for facts and standing up for peace, this is a true pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli position, rather than calling for continuous hatred, violence, killing and burning and maiming, which, quite frankly, is going to lead us nowhere, but just to more, more hatred, more animosity and more killing on both sides, which is a real shame. I just wonder between me and myself, do you think Yasmin realizes who Viterbi is? that the school is actually named after Dr. Andrew Viterbi, you know, co-founder of Qualcomm, a proud Jew himself, somebody who has a long history of supporting Israel. Do you think it crossed her mind at any point? I think she may have learned by now because of some of the pushback. In fact, in response to this whole incident, USC's lack of response, there were over 60 faculty at USC who signed a letter calling on the university to take action against such and, you know, Yasmin's comments specifically and the anti-Semitic trends that we've seen on campus. And one of the signatories of that letter was from the Viterbi family himself. So the, the irony is, uh, is, is rich here. <laughs> The, um, the fact is that that faculty letter was, was sent when? That letter, I think, was sent at the beginning of December. And, yeah. and, and the goal, that was part of the mounting pressure that came from activists and on social media vis-a-vis -vis USC as a result of Yasmin's comments? Yeah, so this was part of the pressure. I didn't have anything to do with it. It actually came from the faculty themselves. Um, but since then, there has been continued press, um, continued pressure from major donors, from other alumni like myself. Um, we have continued to push and, 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 uh, and see that USC issues something stronger about this. I know that they did issue a follow-up statement saying that, oh, actually now we condemn anti-Semitism. 
and all forms of hatred. <laughs> this is just not sufficient. It's just not enough. Uh, they need to take account of, but not only do they need to acknowledge the anti-Semitic nature of it, but I think that they also owe the Jewish community, especially the Jewish community on campus, an apology for how they've handled these issues. And there's just no accountability there. You know, uh, accountability, apology. At the end of the day, let's let's just get down to it. You have a Jewish staff student walking on campus at USC and literally could feel threatened if they have any love and connection and or affiliation to Israel, not just as a result of Yasmin's statements, but as a result of the administration's lack of response in this regard. This is downright matter of, you know, of everyday safety. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the issues that sets this apart from generic criticism of Israel, even if it's illegitimate criticism of Israel. This isn't about criticism. This is about somebody who made a threat during a time of crisis when Jews are being attacked in the streets of Los Angeles and the university has done nothing. Um, you know, it, you mentioned the letter, so I just want to, for the sake of our viewers, to uh, read a couple, a few lines from that letter where the faculty uh, says as follows, we, the undersigned faculty, wish to register our dismay about ongoing open expressions of anti-Semitism and xenophobia on our campus that go unrebuked. The silence of our leadership on this matter is alienating, hurtful, and depressing. It amounts to tacit acceptance of a toxic atmosphere of hatred and hostility. And they specifically mention Yasmin's tweets. Have, have, has the university responded at all to this letter? The university did issue a response, I believe, the following week. And then they issued another one because, as I've said, we've continued to apply pressure not much better than the one before. Um, it's really been pulling teeth to get the university to have an adequate response, which again, as I said, I think that's something else that they should own up to in any further statements. But they also need to revisit as a whole how they're dealing with these issues and they need to be transparent about what they're doing and how they're gonna do it and how they're going to educate their own faculty, their own staff and their own student government leaders about anti-Semitism because obviously there's a huge lack of knowledge about issues of anti-Israel and, and anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And, you know, we need to have a discussion on this campus about what legitimate criticism of Israel is versus anti-Semitism. Because if your student leaders are forcing people out of office because they're Zionist, you don't know what Zionism is. And so the truth is the fact that we're having this discussion continuously for so many years about what is legitimate crit criticism of Israel and what's allowed or, or not allowed on campus is like the faculty says quite depressing but you know your philosophical thought for a minute you know we've been in this field for so many years and we live in an age where every individual group has to be listened to and people have a right to define themselves in this way or another and yet in this individualized environment we still see the jews separated you know um when it's anti-semitism it's allowed the jewish people is not protected on campus the anti-semitism is legitimized and anti-zionism is legitimized how? Why? How could that be? I mean, I'm, I'm just baffled every time when I try to think about this. It, it amazes me. Well, unfortunately, I think this has been part of a concerted effort by leaders of social, social justice movements to push out the Jewish community that they perceive due to a lack of education about this issue as being white. Uh, Jews, no matter the fact that many of them are white passing, do not qualify under intersexual, in, intersectional, excuse me, philosophy as white. White passing is not the same as white. Jews have been murdered throughout history because they are not white, including Jews who looked white. So it, to box Jews out of the discussion of minority groups and the history of oppression of minority groups is completely unjustified and historically inaccurate. And I think that we need to educate ourselves, educate um, our own Jewish community, and we also need to push back hard publicly um, and individually, one-on-one uh, -on -one with groups who are trying to force Jews out of those progressive spaces. I myself don't identify as someone who's progressive, but that doesn't mean that you can't be someone who's progressive and also Zionist and support the existence of the state of Israel. And other people need to understand how that's the case. I also want to add one more thing about Yasmin's comments. A lot of times today we see um, 
criticism of Zionism or criticism of Israel, and people aren't sure if that actually means anti-Semitism. There's not a public understanding about this, despite the fact that there is a consensus definition of anti-Semitism according to the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which does say that anti-Zionism today is often, if not always, manifested, uh, anti-Semitism, excuse me, is always manifested as anti-Zionism. But um, I think it's important to note that when it comes to Yasmin's comments, it wasn't just about Israel. Uh, she actually tweeted, curse the Jews, at the same time period of all of these anti-Israel tweets um, in Arabic, she tweeted in Arabic. And then when people called her out on it, she went on a long rant about how that's actually a mistranslation of it. It's not. <laughs> all the Arabic speaking Jews had a good laugh at that <laughs> Twitter thread. Um, but it's very, very clear in these cases that anti-Zionism and this form of criticism, the embrace of violence against Jews is anti-Semitism. Um, and we see, instead of more acceptance of it, we see more people trying to excuse it. And this is a very, very dangerous territory, also physically, as I mentioned before. We need to push back very strongly against this, this line of thinking and this rhetoric because it's absolutely false and it's extremely dangerous. And I think that we need to work on building more allies and educating more groups, including outside the Jewish community, about what anti-Semitism looks like today and why, because this is going to be critical to pushing back against this normalization of violence. You know, um, you're mentioning the uh, ridiculous game between English and Arabic and her attempts to, uh, you know, escape that translation. It reminds me about the direct connection between those entities uh, working against Israel. She tweeted her lover Hamas. And over the weekend, as you know, in, in Tel Aviv, Hamas claimed that it fired those missiles into the sea across from Tel Aviv as a result of a storm or the lightning, they all seem to be hiding, uh, you know, hiding their hatred behind ridiculous excuses, thinking what, I'm not sure. I know, and it's amazing because the it seems that the excuses continue to get dumber <laughs> with every incident that happens. And yet still, somehow there are some people who are convinced by it, which is just, it's outrageous. It's really, really outrageous. But the only way to, to fight it is to, is to continue to push back. And like I said, build new alliances, help to educate groups, educate younger groups, educate older groups, do all you can to build connections with other people and help get the word out. Emily, I'm a big fan. I love your activism. I love your social media outreach. I love your videos and connections. Um, I just wanna ask you for the sake of everybody watching, how can they follow you to continue to applying that pressure and to continue to push for justice, for truth, for peace, for Israel, for safety and against anti-Semitism? Where should they go? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Emily K. Schrader and then also on Instagram at Emily in Tel Aviv, like the TV show, but not in Paris, in Tel Aviv. <laughs> That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for everything you do for the fight for Israel and for providing us all with this important update. I'll keep in touch. I want to see how things progress and what happens with USC. And we will follow your social media channels so that we can all join in in applying pressure because we can't allow these instances to die down. We have to make sure that the message is heard loud and clear, not just at USC, but across the board and at every place where anti-Semitism is allowed, legitimized, and people think they can get away with it, lightnings or not, they cannot. Thank you. Absolutely. So much, Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And to all of you, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy, and a happy new year. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Razani. Until next time, shalom and later.